So it's my privilege to introduce to you the Reverend Dr. Christopher Wright. Uh, and I want to say just a couple things about him. You, I would encourage you to actually read the little sheet with, with some of the more details. But I want to say just a couple things. The first is that uh, Chris is a biblical scholar. And his work, uh, his writings, uh, are and continue to be very influential. In fact, one of his books has been a central text at Wycliffe College in our courses for uh, six or seven years. And it is one of the courses that we really encourage our students to take the time and to engage deeply in what Chris does to reshape the way that we think, particularly about the Old Testament, and the way that it frames our understanding of God's mission in the world. You can get copies of his books downstairs. <laughs> so Crux is the best little theological bookstore in Toronto, at least, if not much more widely, and it's right downstairs. So if you haven't been to Crux, I would encourage you to take the opportunity to go down there and see what they have. And they obviously have uh, copies of Chris's books and also, of course, of our other speakers as well. But the second area that I want to mention about Chris is his leadership. Uh, it's not very often that you find someone who's both a biblical scholar as well as being a significant leader in the Christian world. And Chris, uh, for many years, was working at All Nations. And All Nations, you may not know of it, but is a uh, place for training people for mission in the UK and has had a very significant impact on the church, both in the UK and obviously much more broadly as well. And he worked there for quite a while. But for the last 15 years, he's been working with Langham Partnership International, which John mentioned to you briefly. And you can find out more about that because there's a display booth just outside the door. Langham Partnership International is something that grew out of John Stott's uh, vision and mission and understanding for the church and uh, is very significant in its work around the world uh, at this point in time. It, uh, it has worked for a long time helping scholars from the two-thirds world come and study in the Western world in order to go back to their countries and become leaders in teaching uh, and in the church and a mission in their areas. But it has also, for a while, done preaching workshops. And it does preaching workshops for people, again, in the two-thirds world, really helping people know how to preach and how to engage with, um, with the scripture in a way that then helps form Christian community. And then the final area that Lang and Partnership works in is with publishing commentaries that are actually written uh, for people in the two-thirds world, directly aimed at the, uh, at the people in those communities. So it's had a very significant ministry, if you don't know about it. Um, and Ed has more information to back uh, about that, uh, about Lang and Partnership. If you don't know about it, I encourage you to take the time. I know Chris would be happy to speak about it, uh, but also the, the booth back and Ed is there, and he would be happy to talk with you about it. So I think it's a great privilege that we have to have uh, Chris. If you want to come up, Chris, that'd be great. And um, to, to have him here, and I'll just let you know that he's actually in Canada for a short time, but his speaking engagements are very full. He's speaking five times more. Six, six times more. So we're privileged to have him here. And I just want to begin just by saying a prayer for Chris uh, as he speaks to us and also for us as we hear him. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, I thank you so much for Chris. And I thank you for the ways that you have shaped and molded and formed him, that you have gifted him, and that you have and continue to use his gifts for your church, for your people around the world. Pray your blessing on him uh, in his time with us, that you will sustain him, that you will strengthen him, and that what he has to share will be an encouragement and a uh, help to all of us in the things that we do in your for your world and in your church. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you uh, for your welcome, Peter. And uh, it's good to be here and to be with you. It's actually nice to be back here at Wycliffe because I have been a few times before. Um, and of course, uh, the last few times would have been when uh, whatever number of principal uh, Bishop George Sumner now Bishop of Dallas was, I was here during his time, he's now down in warmer climes down in Dallas, uh, and of course I also am a very good personal friend of the incoming principal, uh, Bishop Stephen Andrews, and I look forward to meeting him later today, and uh, he of course is the chairman of the board of Langham Partnership here in Canada. I'm also well aware that coming to Wintrip, uh, to this August place uh, also is in a sense following in the footsteps of John Stott because I know that he was here on more than one occasion. He 
would spend at least a week here teaching uh, in, in years gone by and was well known in Canada. And so there's a certain sense of, uh, uh, well, I'm sure there's reluctance or fear in the sense of actually standing where he probably once stood and sharing with you in, in that ministry. Uh, thank you, Peter, for what you said about the Langham Partnership. I do hope you will please take the literature that's there, some of it's on the seats. And if you just want to know more, not necessarily commit yourself to anything, but simply to get more information, do fill in this little white card and just pop it in the basket that's on the table and then someone from Langham here in Canada will get in touch with you uh, and that will be the way we can move forward. By the way, um, just in case you're wondering where the accent comes from, um, I, as you can tell, I am British, but I'm not English. I'm from Northern Ireland, from Belfast. So, uh, I like to say that because sometimes people say to me afterwards, I spent the whole time wondering where you come from. All right, that's, that's the answer. Okay. Now our subject, uh, at least for, for me this morning, is this whole area of mission and the Great Commission and how we integrate our mission together. Uh, and I want to just begin by reading those words of the Great Commission as a kind of text. Uh, it's not the only place I want to look, but it's the central place. The end of Matthew's Gospel, we all remember this. The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Although some doubted. Matthew's very honest at that point. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So the Great Commission. And so we, we think this morning in this session and then after a coffee break for a second session about this whole issue of what is the mission of the church? What is mission all about? Uh, and that's a big subject. And uh, earlier on, uh, John made that joke about Pontius Pilate, uh, I thought I would start with another one. It's actually a Swedish person I first heard say this, so you can blame him, not me. But he said that talking about mission is sometimes a bit like being a mos like a mosquito on a nudist beach. It's hard to know where to start. Uh, that's a Swedish. I don't, I don't know if they had mosquitoes in Sweden, but uh, there we go. They have the other thing, I'm quite sure. So holding it all together, where do you start? There are all sorts of phrases, all sorts of jargon and ways of talking about it. For example, you've probably heard about a holistic mission, uh, which became a very popular phrase some years ago. That is that uh, in our mission we should be tackling the whole of human need. Uh, not just the spiritual, but also material and economic and all dimensions. Wherever sin and evil have created mess and problems in human life, our mission should be addressing that. And I think that's right and good. But it can still leave our mission very anthropocentric, very centered on human beings. Me and my problem, or you and yours. And mission can then become rather therapeutic. We are here to help you solve your needs. Or as I saw uh, on the side of a church near where I'm staying at the moment, uh, one of their slogans says, help us, no, uh, what is it? Yeah, let us help you find inner peace and joy that you deserve. I thought, hmm, I thought the gospel was about finding the joy and peace we don't deserve. Uh, but anyway, there we are. So it can be very therapeutic. Well, here's another one. Uh, missional church. You've probably heard that, I'm sure. It uh, seems to have uh, started somewhere south of the border and spread around the world. This idea, you know, you've got to be missional as a church. Uh, and again, that is right and true that everything the church is and does ought to be connected to its mission, what we're here for. I'll say more about that in a minute. But then this can still leave us with a certain self-centered approach to the whole issue. Not so much sinners in need of salvation as saints in need of a mission. Here we are as the church, what are we supposed to be doing? What do we include in our mission? And so for all these reasons, it seems to me that we need primary to go back to the beginning and to ask what is the mission of God? What is God about in the world? So that whatever we do, whatever we think we should be doing, should at the very least be drawn from what God is doing. And where do we find that? Well, I think that one of the best places, or at least one of the shortest places, that the Apostle Paul speaks about the mission of God is in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Where Paul says this, 
that God has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure purposed in Christ. Now when Paul talks about the will of God, he's not usually talking about God's personal will for me and my life, uh, you know, guidance. We do want to seek God's will for our own lives, but that's not usually what Paul means by the will of God. He means this great cosmic purpose, verse 10, to be put into effect when the times reach their conclusion to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Paul says that's God's mission. That's God's agenda. That's what God is doing in the whole story of the Bible, from creation through to new creation. God is bringing about this healing, restored, redeemed, unified, reconciled creation in and through Jesus Christ as Lord and God and Savior and Judge of the earth. That, I think, is what Paul meant when he uses that phrase to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, when he said, I didn't hesitate to preach to you the whole counsel of God, that whole scriptural will of God from Genesis to Revelation. Now, I expect you've probably heard of uh, the Lausanne movement. If you're familiar with John Stott, I'm sure you have, because he was involved with the original Lausanne Congress on World Evangelization, held in Lausanne in Switzerland in 1974, and then developing into a movement which eventually came to its third Congress in Cape Town in, in October of 2010, from which was produced this document, the Cape Town Commitment. I do hope that the Crooks Bookshop has got some copies of this, uh, this little booklet. If, you, if it hasn't, then you can't buy it, it's only $8. Uh, Edward's raising a hand, we have some copies at the back, um, but also you can even download it for free if you're too stingy to buy one uh, from the Lausanne website. And here's how it defines the mission of God, and I, I rather like these phrases, uh, I'm going to put them on the screen and read them, but as I do, if you could be listening with sort of your biblical antenna waving, listening for the echoes of scripture in here, because I think this is a very scripturally rooted statement. It says this, that we are committed to world mission because it is central to our understanding of God, the Bible, the church, human history, and the ultimate future. The whole Bible reveals the mission of God to bring all things in heaven and on earth into unity under Christ, reconciling them through the blood of his cross. In fulfilling his mission, God will transform the creation broken by sin and evil into the new creation in which there is no more sin or curse. God will fulfill his promise to Abraham to bless all nations on earth through the gospel of Jesus the Messiah, the seed of Abraham. God will transform the fractured world of nations that are scattered under the judgment of God into the new humanity that will be redeemed by the blood of Christ from every tribe and nation and people and language and will be gathered to worship our God and Saviour. God will destroy the reign of death, corruption and violence when Christ returns to establish his eternal reign of life, justice and peace. And then God, Emmanuel, will dwell with us and the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Well, don't you say amen or something? <laughs> At least after a statement like that. Sometimes read this in, in Africa and they go, hallelujah! You know, they think up and down, but you're Canadian, so I don't suppose you'll, uh, you'll, you'll do that. But I hope there's, thank you, yeah. I hope there's some sense of hearing those words that yes, that is what God is about. That is the mission of God. Uh, it involves all creation and all nations. It is all centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. But of course, it still leaves the so what question. If that is the mission of God, what is the mission of God's people? If God's mission, what God is planning for the creation, is as vast and comprehensive as that, surely at least there must be something comparably comprehensive about our mission. God invites us in to a very big agenda uh, when he invites us to share in his mission. Now, down through the uh, years, of course, Christians and denominations and agencies have tried to define what is the mission of the church. And I know that at least uh, some of us here are, are Anglicans. And within the Anglican communion in 1984, they produced a document in which they spoke about the five marks of mission. 
They said the mission of Christ Church includes, and here they are, I've just put them around this diagram, first of all, evangelism, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Number two, teaching, nurturing, and discipling new believers. Teaching. Thirdly, works of compassion and love and mercy, as Jesus did. And then fourthly, seeking to address the unjust structures of society, to seek justice in the kingdom of God. And fifthly, to care for the creation, the uh, life and integrity of the earth itself, in which God has put us. And so, there they are, these five marks in that circle, evangelism, teaching, compassion, justice, and the care of creation. And I think that is a remarkably comprehensive list. And what I think also is that they, all of those things have deep roots in the Bible. That every one of them can be justified and rationalized from the Bible. And indeed, as I hope to show through this morning, can be connected, either directly or indirectly, to the Great Commission. But what I put at the center of that diagram, as you can see, is of course crucial that those five marks must be integrated around the Lordship of Jesus Christ, or the Kingdom of God, which is what the Lordship of Christ is about. It's the reign of God through Christ. Because in the Great Commission, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Everything flows from his Lordship. Think about it. In evangelism, what are we doing? We are proclaiming the good news that Jesus of Nazareth is Lord and God and Saviour. In teaching, we are bringing people into maturity in Christ, helping them to grow up in their relationship with Christ as their Lord. In works of compassion, we are following the example of Jesus, who went about doing good, as Peter said to Cornelius in Acts 10. In seeking justice in society, we remember that Jesus Christ is on the throne of God and that all justice flows from his throne. He is the Lord of the kings of the earth, as Revelation 1 says, as he said himself in Revelation. And in creation care, we are caring for what belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ by right of creation and redemption, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So five marks of mission. I like to keep things simple whenever I can. I was a teacher of students for about 20 years or so, and the simpler you can make things, the better. So I, I group things together like this, and I think this is, at least I find it helpful, because surely we can put evangelism and teaching together as the combined work of building the church, bringing people to repentance and faith and obedience, and then building them up in the community of believers for the purpose of their mission in the world. So building the church through evangelism and teaching. And then on the other side of the diagram, you can see there, serving society through the activities of compassion and love and justice. In other words, being sent into the world as Jesus said he sends us, as the Father sent me into the world, so I send you to love, to serve, to be salt and light, as he said in Matthew, to do good, as Paul kept saying to his, uh, the people that he had brought to faith in Christ, to fulfill an Abrahamic mandate of being a blessing to the nations, or as Jeremiah told the exiles in Babylon, to seek the welfare of the city where God has put you. That's all part of what it means to be God's people. And then thirdly, uh, at the bottom of the diagram, caring for creation, which I think actually is fulfilling the very first great commission. Yes, we talk about the end of Matthew's Gospel as the Great Commission, but the very first great mandate that God gave to the human race was to exercise dominion over creation on God's behalf and in God's way, and to do so by caring and keeping it when you combine Acts chapter 1, uh, sorry, Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. So you might be saying at this point, okay, see all this, but we were talking about the Great Commission a few minutes ago. And doesn't the Great Commission just tell us to go and evangelize the world? Well, no, actually, it doesn't just say that. It certainly includes it, but that's not all there is to it. In spite of uh, the slogan that I saw at one of those Great Missions Fest congresses that happened here in Canada, the one that I was at was in Vancouver, 
uh, about 15 years ago. And uh, when I got to the great convention hall there, the Missions Fest, all around the walls with a big slogan that said, Just go! Exclamation mark. And I thought, just hold on. That's actually not what Jesus just said. Um, unless we're sort of letting Nike brand the whole thing. You know, just do it. Just go. Um, no, no. Jesus began not with a command, but with a statement. All authority in heaven and earth is given to me. We need to put the cosmic, universal lordship of Jesus Christ at the very heart and center of everything that we do as Christian believers, whether we, whether we explicitly call it mission or not. So we build the church because Jesus is Lord of the church. But we also serve society because Jesus is Lord, not Caesar, of every king and government and president and society and culture on the planet. He is the Lord of the kings of the earth. We need to get our theology of the sovereignty of God and the Lordship of Christ to bring it into our engagement in the world and society, not just in the sacred Christian churchy kind of things. We serve society under the banner of the Lordship of Jesus if we're going to do it as Christians and if it's going to be part of our Christian mission. And we care for creation because Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. The earth is the Lord's, says Psalm 24 and repeats Paul in Corinthians referring to Jesus. So I think there is a legitimacy to this triple dimension of mission. That it includes, yes, our ministry to those who are sinners who need to repent and be saved. And our mission in society that is suffering and broken and fractured. And our commitment to the earth in which we live in our ecological concern. That's one of the ways, again, in which the Cape Town commitment, it seems to me, uh, has taken one step further than the Lausanne Covenant, which brought together evangelism and social engagement as part of our mission. The Cape Town Commitment says this, that the gospel is God's good news through the cross and resurrection of Jesus for individual persons and for society and for creation. All three are broken and suffering because of sin. And I think the Bible makes that very clear. And all three are included in the redeeming love and mission of God. And so all three must therefore be part of a comprehensive mission of God's people. So let's, let's go around that circle uh, that we saw a few minutes ago, thinking about our mission in relation to the church and people's need to know the gospel and to come to faith in Jesus and grow up in him, in terms of society and people's need for compassion and love and justice in the world and for creation and its need for responsible, godly use and care that God has commanded us to do. So first of all then, building the church, Jesus said, making disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. Inevitably, that therefore presupposes the work of evangelism, because evangelism is simply gospeling. It's actually a bit of a pity that in the English language, the word evangel or evangelism has got separated from the word gospel, because in, in, in Jesus' world, in the world of the apostles, it was the same word. Uh, the word meant good news, evangelion or evangelium in Latin, and you announced good news when you gospeled. It's, it's all the same thing. It's proclaiming that we have good news for the world. Something has happened. There's stuff to tell people about. In fact, the Roman emperors used the word uh, very arrogantly and quite often. They spoke about the Evangelium, the good news, that Octavian Caesar has defeated Antony in the Battle of Actium in 33 BC, and there's good news because he's going to give Pax peace to the world. And so this is good news for all the nations in all the world that our great God and Saviour, that's the language they used about Caesar, our great God and Saviour has brought peace. Paul used that kind of language. The apostles said, yeah, we've got evangelium. We've got good news. And it's a lot better good news than Caesar brings you. Good news of peace with God and peace together and the reconciling power of God for all nations. So we go into the world to proclaim that God has done something. That the God who created this world has acted to save the world from the consequences of sin and rebellion and evil that he has done so through his son, Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Messiah promised for ages in the Old Testament scriptures, 
who is the one who came and died for our sins on the cross, taking the weight of human evil and all that Satan could hurl against him, but whom God raised up from the dead, and we have seen him, they proclaimed, and that he is now exalted at God's right hand and will return as King and Saviour and Judge of the earth. And the good news is that evil will not have the last word and that God's kingdom will win the day, ultimately and eternally. And so you tell that story, you share that good news. And as people are called to repent, to turn away from their own lives and stories and the world story, and to put their faith in Jesus, and to plug themselves into this story, what God is doing in the world, then, says Jesus, baptize them into relationship with God the Father who loves them, and God the Son who died for them, and God the Holy Spirit who will live within them and bear his fruit in their lives. And so that is the work to which Christ calls us in this, in a sense, opening part of the Great Commission. Go and make disciples as Jesus had made them, uh, and bring them into that relationship with him. And so this, uh, this gospeling, this gospel, I think, needs to be at the center of our integrated mission. Because it seems to me that there are several ways in which the phrase holistic mission gets misused. And I just wanted as a, almost a little digression at this point to make this. Because that idea of holistic mission is sometimes used in two ways that I think are rather misleading. One is that some people have used the language of holistic mission to mean basically everything else that the church might do except evangelism. Holistic mission is all the social stuff, the social action, the advocacy, the getting involved in poverty and development and all of that. In fact, there was even uh, a, a time when Lausanne was doing that, and I objected, uh, because I went along to the Lausanne Forum in 2004, uh, and they had 31 special interest groups, SIGs, that they were called special interest groups for mission, oh, Muslim mission, mission among the handicapped, mission for children, and so on. And one of the special interest groups was holistic mission. I was horrified. I thought, I thought holistic mission was the whole thing, uh, not just all the social and development stuff. Because social action without evangelism is no more holistic than evangelism without social involvement. But the other way that the phrase can sometimes then get used is also a bit misleading. That holistic mission just means everything and anything the church does just whatever you want to do, like a bag of marbles, you know, just pick the one, the color you like. No integration, just a lot of stuff that the church might do. Everything and anything, like a sort of smorgasbord, just take your pick, uh, whatever you want to do. No, no, no. It seems to me that we need to have this centrality of the gospel at the very heart of what we're doing. Uh, and I use that word centrality of the gospel in preference to the other equally important historical Lausanne phrase, they spoke about the primacy of evangelism. But I think the primacy of evangelism tends to throw us back to mission being what we do, human-centered. Whereas the centrality of the gospel phrase points us to what God has done. It says what we need to connect ourselves with is what God has done to save the world, which is what the gospel is. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. And I use this language of center or central, not in a way that then makes everything else peripheral. You know, this is the really central thing and nothing else matters. It's all just secondary and out there around the margins. I don't mean a marginalizing center, but an integrating center. That the Lordship of Christ, the proclamation of the kingdom of God in Jesus of Nazareth, has to be what holds together everything we do as Christians. It's a bit like the song that John was singing earlier, that worship is life, life is worship, and so is mission. It involves all that we do in and for Christ. And so it holds these things together, integrates them in the way that a hub is central to a wheel. And a wheel is an integrated object, if it's a, a, a wheel and not just a hoop. The wheel is the integration of the hub, which is connected to the engine, through the axle, that's where the power is, that's what's going to drive the car. But the hub has to be connected through the tire and the spokes with the road, the context, where life is. 
And so therefore we need the integration of the hub of the gospel, connected to the power of what God has done, the story of God's activity in Christ. But it needs to be embodied, enfleshed, lived out, as it were, where the rubber hits the road, uh, as you might say, at the rim. And that's the kind of way, again, in which the Cape Town Commitment has tried to express that integration uh, when it's talking about the mission. Uh, in part 1, section 10, it talks about the integrity of our mission. That the source of all our mission is what God has done in Christ for the redemption of the world, as revealed in the Bible. And so our evangelistic task is to make that good news known to all nations. That's the heart of the gospel. That's the source, the engine, the power. But the context of all our mission is the world in which we live. The world of sin and suffering, injustice and creational disorder, into which God sends us to love and serve for Christ's sake. All our mission, there, therefore, must reflect the integration of evangelism and committed engagement in the world. Both, that is, both evangelism and social action, being ordered and driven by the whole biblical revelation of the gospel of God. It then quotes from the Lausanne Covenant, and then it quotes this from the Micah Declaration, which some of you may have heard of, the Micah Network, and I'm quoting, Integral mission, or integrated mission, it's a phrase that comes from Latin America, mission integral, is the proclamation and demonstration of the gospel. It's not simply that evangelism and social involvement are to be done alongside each other, Rather, in integral mission, our proclamation has social consequences as we call people to love and repentance in all areas of life. And our social involvement has evangelistic consequences as we bear witness to the transforming grace of Jesus Christ. If we ignore the world, we betray the word of God, which sends us out to serve the world. But if we ignore the word of God, then we have nothing to bring to the world. And so we need the integration of both. So the centrality of the gospel, the very heart, therefore, of that diagram, the gospel of the kingdom of God, of the lordship of Jesus Christ, driving and ordering all that we do, and beginning with evangelism. But as you can see, underneath evangelism comes teaching. Because Jesus did not just say, make disciples, baptize them, but also, and teaching them, he said. Jesus himself knew and practiced this, that it was not enough simply to bring people to repentance and faith. Rather, the word that was preached and so on needed to find deep roots in the good soil, as he said in his parable. That that soil needed to be watered, as the Apostle Paul would put it. That people need to be discipled, need teaching, need to grow up in their faith. Now, it's not surprising that Jesus... Uh, said that because he came of course with the background of the scriptures of the Old Testament and the Old Testament as Andrew Walls once said in a lecture I heard him give, the Old Testament is the oldest and longest program of theological education. As an Old Testament lecturer I loved that. Uh, in fact uh, it came in a, a conference I was at up in the Overseas Ministry Study Centre in New Haven, Connecticut and the conference was on this topic of the relationship between mission and theological education. And uh, Andrew Walls had been asked to give the paper on the historical dimension of theological education. I suppose some of us thought that perhaps he would begin with Oregon or at the great schools of Alexandria and Antioch and the early church fathers and so on and their teaching and theological training. But no, this was his opening sentence. The Old Testament itself is a program of theological education. What was God doing for those hundreds, thousands of years with those people? He was teaching them the truth about God, about creation, about what it means to be the people of God, what it means to be human in God's image, what sin is all about and what redemption is all about and how it is to worship God and how it is to live for God. All the scriptures, the law, the prophets, the Psalms, the wisdom, teaching the people what it means to live in God's world. So not surprisingly, therefore, Jesus spends his three years teaching, teaching, teaching. Rabbi, they called him, because that's what he was doing. So you might say, well, what's this got to do with mission? What is that relationship? Well, you see, if you look at the book of Acts and Paul's letters, at the one who is regarded as the greatest 
church planting missionary of the scriptures, namely the Apostle Paul himself, we find that teaching was integral to how he viewed his own missionary career. Yes, of course, he planted churches, he preached the gospel, he got stoned for doing so. But wherever he could, he stayed back to teach the believers that he had brought to faith in Christ. Of course, sometimes he couldn't because he got chucked out or the stone or whatever, and he didn't, wasn't able to stay very long. But he stayed 18 months in Corinth to teach the believers there. He stayed nearly three years in Ephesus. And then when he couldn't stay, he wrote letters. And then when he, even in addition to writing letters, he had a team that made sure they were teaching the church. And that's what he instructed them to do, people like Timothy and Titus. Uh, and above all, I think, Apollos. I'm really rather fond of Apollos because in some ways he's the first truly cross-cultural missionary, in a sense, in the New Testament, because he comes from Africa. He, we read that he was a, a learned Jew from Alexandria, which is a city in Egypt, North Africa. And he'd been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor because he knew the scriptures, and somehow he had come to faith in Jesus. So he's an educated, learned, theologically trained Jewish believer in Jesus. And he comes from Africa to Asia, because he gets to Ephesus, which is the capital of the province of Asia. And there, uh, he has some more theological education with Priscilla and Aquila in their home. And they explain to him more accurately the way of the Lord. And then, having come from Africa to Asia, he goes across to Europe, because he goes to Achaia, which is the southern part of Greece. And the brothers and sisters encouraged him there, and he was a great help to those who they grace had believed. Now, what was Apollos doing in the church in Corinth? He vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures, which of course means the Old Testament scriptures, he didn't have Matthew's gospel or anything like that yet, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ. Apollos was engaged in what we would call systematic theological education of the believers. He was a teacher. He was learned in the scriptures. And in our kind of curriculum terms, well, there was no seminary in those days, but he was engaged in apologetics, Old Testament hermeneutics, and Christology. Public debate, using the scriptures, teaching about Jesus. He was a theological educator. And he was a missionary. The point I'm trying to make here is that when that church in Corinth then had a bit of a split, and some were saying, we really support Paul because he's our great founder of our denomination. He's our missionary. He's our church planter. And others said, well, we prefer Apollos because he's actually a better teacher. He's more fluent. He's more articulate. He's more handsome. Whatever it was, they wanted Apollos instead of Paul. And Paul says, no, no, you mustn't do that. You can't divide us up like that. He says, yes, I planted the church. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He was the evangelist. The person who first preached the gospel to the pagans in Corinth. And Apollos watered the church. He had taught them systematically. But then, says Paul, the one who plants, the evangelist, and the one who waters, the theological teacher, have one purpose, one mission. In one translation, in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 5 to 9. In fact, the literal words that Paul uses are, they are one. One mission, one task. In other words, theological education as part of the teaching role of the church is part of the Great Commission. It is part of what mission includes. <coughs> and I'm passionately committed to that. Uh, partly because it's what Langham Partnership does. But I think I believed it even before that, um, before starting the work for Langham. Because it's there in the Great Commission, isn't it? Jesus did not just say make disciples. He said, and teaching them. On one occasion in the early days that, uh, of my involvement with Langham, it must have been about 2001 or two or thereabouts, and I was trying to explain to somebody uh, what Langham Partnership is and does uh, in relation to our uh, program for scholars, and our provision of books, uh, and our training of preachers. Uh, and they said to me, oh, so you're not really a missionary organization then, are you? <coughs> I sort of got quite cross, at least inside myself, I did. I said, yeah, of course we are. Great Commission, line three, haven't you read it? And teaching them. The teaching task of the church. 
whether it happens in a formal sense in theological education, or indeed whether it happens every Sunday in a church with a pastor standing up to preach the scriptures, the teaching of disciples, the teaching of the church, is obedience to the Great Commission. It's part of what Jesus expected to happen. And therefore it is rightly called missional. There is a missional dimension to theological education. And so even though within the line of partnership we aren't, quote, sending out missionaries, uh, there are lots of organizations that do that. There are many uh, organizations committed to evangelism and church planting. God bless them, that's crucial. That is part of the Great Commission. But our role in Langham, I see, as more the Apollos of Christian mission. Apollos is kind of my patron saint uh, in Langham. Because Langham is that which comes alongside the church, seeks to strengthen the church, uh, to provide the resources for the teaching of the Bible uh, and the training of pastors in the skills of biblical preaching. So that's, therefore, what I wanted to say in this first session. We really looked uh, around this left-hand side uh, following in the Lordship of Christ, we are engaged in building the church through the work of evangelism and the work of teaching. Both must go together within the integrated, integral aspect of world mission. We're going to take a break, I think, and then after we've had a bit of a break, we'll come back and think about the other sides of the diagram. Serving society, care for creation. How do we integrate that within our understanding of biblical mission? Why don't I pray, and then we'll do whatever somebody says we need to do uh, in order to get our refreshment. Father, we thank you for being with us up to this point through your spirits, both in our worship, in song, and in prayer, and in our thinking about your word, and what it has to say to us about our commitment to the gospel, and the discipling of those who come to faith in Christ. May these things remain in our mind and help us to reflect on them. We ask in Jesus' name.